sing this with me. Take the burden from my arms. Take the anchors off my lungs. And take me broken and make me one. And break the silence and make it a song. Cause life is short. I wanna leave you well. Good morning. It is great to see you here. My name is Kenny Lewis, and I'm the worship pastor, and I want to welcome you here to Grace Community Church. You know, if you're standing here right now, you survived 2021. That's a great, that's a great accomplishment. Amen. <laughs> well, this morning, what we're going to do, if you want to stand, stand. If you want to sit, sit. It's totally up to you. But the one thing I ask is that please let us as brothers and sisters in Christ, let us worship this God who is worthy. Let's lift up our voices. If this song is new to you, pick it up as soon as you can. Pretty easy to sing along. Whatever is true, whatever is right. All right, here we go. Sing this with me. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is light, lead me in the way everlasting. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. Yeah. Stop. 
better. I don't want to live outside your ways. I don't want to miss your heart for me. Because you're the way. Yes, he is. You're the way. I don't want to live outside your ways. I don't want to miss your heart for me. Because you're the way. Oh, 
hope still walks with the hurting if you're still alive and breathing praise the lord don't stop dancing and dreaming there's still good news worth repeating so lift your head and keep singing praise the lord joy still comes in the morning and hope still walks with the hurting if you're still alive and breathing praise the lord don't stop dancing and dreaming there's still good news worth repeating so lift your head and keep singing praise the lord
Praise the King. You may be seated. We've come to our time of communion this morning. Instructions on how we do communion here at Grace are on the back of your bulletin if you would like to refer to those. You know, over the years, for 2,000 years actually, 
Christianity has had its share of critics. And one of the early criticisms of Christianity, and still you hear it today, is Christianity is a bloody religion. A bloody religion. And of course, you know, that comes from, of course, our Jewish roots where the sacrificial system, where animal sacrifices were uh, performed in the temple. And then even as Christians, uh, we, we have a Savior who was nailed to a cross and a, a, a spear was lanced in his side and blood was poured out. And so, yeah, Christianity is a bloody religion. In fact, did you know that in the early church, one of the reasons Christians were persecuted was the, I know this is going to sound strange, Christians were accused of cannibalism. And the rumor circulated, oh, you know those Christians, that they get together behind closed doors and they eat the body and they drink the blood. And because of that misunderstanding and the rumor began to spread, Christians were persecuted because of their cannibalism. Now, of course, we're not cannibals, but we also know that in a very real way, Christianity is a bloody religion. And when you think about it, it says something about how God feels about the seriousness of sin. If sin was no big deal to God, then why would a life have to be sacrificed for sin to be paid for? I want us to realize today when we come forward that when we take the the little wafer that we are remembering that Jesus Christ, his body was nailed to a cross for us. And when we dip it in the cup, I want us to remember Christianity is a bloody religion. It took the blood of the perfect Lamb of God to pay for your sins and mine. So as we take the bread and dip it in the cup, on our way back to the seats, may we remember, God, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you dealt with our enormous sin problem in a perfect sacrifice. God, we realize it cost you the life of your son, but we are so eternally grateful that he was willing to go to the cross and to have his body broken and his blood shed for us. We take this communion now in the wonderful name of Christ with gratitude in our hearts. Amen. Front rows, if you would just go to your right and circle around. Thank you.
took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out right. again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. I guess Christianity is a bloody religion. Guilty as charged. Praise God for the blood of Christ. Hey, can we say a big thank you? Our music and media team, they have led us all through the Advent season. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You are just wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, welcome to all of you, a special welcome to any of our guests today. If you're a first-time guest, inside the uh, bulletin when you came in, there is a connection card. We would love it if you would take a moment, fill that out. If you give us your name and address, we'll get a gift to you. Also, if you are a returning guest, there's a place on the card. You can check that. we just like to get to know you better. Thanks so much for being a part and coming back to be with us again. And on a, uh, on a personal note, you know, the, the last couple of weeks I made this joke about that there was a, a fourth wise man, but you remember he was sent packing because his gift was a fruitcake. And then I said, you know, the archaeologists found the fruitcake and it was still in good shape. I would like to think the anonymous person, I have no idea who it was, who brought me a fruitcake this week. So I want you to know it was, it was delicious. It, it was a little dry 
But I checked the expiration. It was 14 A.D. was the expiration date. So just a tad dry. Hey, we want to receive our offering now. And thank you. Thank you guys for your gifts this year. Uh, our deacon board, it's so important for us as we are making plans for the next year financially to have your in gifts. Thank you. You have been so generous all year. And uh, may God bless you as you have given so sacrificially. The gifts today, our offering is for members and regular attenders. If you're a guest, you just sit back. You're our guest. You don't feel any obligation to give. Let's take a moment and pray. Well, Lord, thank you for your wonderful provision this year. You have provided for us individually and as families and as a church family. And Lord, we pray a blessing upon each gift today and a special blessing upon each giver. May they know and, and experience your joy and your peace in their gifts today. We pray it through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let's sing that again. Worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. We sing one song. Worthy, 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 Lord, forever, forever. Worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. We sing one song. Good morning. Wasn't that wonderful? That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick. They're applauding you. It's not every day you get your boss to bring you a pulpit. This is a great day for me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, welcome to Grace. My name is Kevin Price, and I am the 201 pastor here which means that I am over uh, small groups, discipleship, and, uh, and every once in a while I get to stand up here and speak to you. And I just want to tell you, every time I do it, I don't take advantage of it, I, or I try not to. Uh, it's a very humbling experience because I think people can uh, choose anywhere to go. And the fact that you've chosen to come out of your food coma from yesterday and show up this morning means a great deal to me. I'm still coming out of mine, so today could be funny or bad. We'll just see which way it goes. 
Um, okay, a couple of announcements before we get started. Number one is uh, big changes, January 9th. Mark that on your calendar, January 9th, big changes. We're going to be moving the uh, children's ministry from Wednesday night to Sunday night, okay? And that's a real big deal. Make sure you mark it down. What time did I say? What day? January 9th. Very good. You're listening. That was a test. Um, uh, around that time, our small groups will be starting as well. And uh, Financial Peace University is going to be starting back up too. And we have information about that on the 201 table, along with uh, information about uh, parenting through the ages, or I'm sorry, through the phases. You know, the kids have been out of school. Uh, they're probably, I know that none of your kids get on your nerves, mine either, but you may need like, how do I overcome what's going on? So that is coming up. That information is on the 201 table as well. I want to encourage you to go by and get that information. Well, uh, why don't you stand to your feet this morning? Go ahead and stand to your feet. Greet those people around you this morning. Give them a hug. Uh, tell them Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Let them know they're welcome. All right, good morning. You can be seated. Hope you got to everybody you wanted to. Uh, it truly is a privilege to see you this morning, and I really am glad that you're here. Thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to uh, come to church this morning. I pray that something I say today may bless you. Um, and if not, we don't give refunds on offerings, so it's, you're kind of stuck with what I am. All right. This morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the, our scripture for the day, and then I'm going to go back and break it down for you, and we're going to talk about some elements of it, okay? Sound fair? All right. Our scripture today is found in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, uh, and this is what it says. It's on the screen for you if you'd like to follow along. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober, uh, my, so, of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift God, you have received to serve others as faithful servants, stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Uh, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. That is the key, right? So that uh, uh, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And everyone said amen, right? That's what scripture says. We say amen to that. So I don't know where you were on December 31st, 1999, but I know where I was. I had just gotten married. I had just celebrated our one-year anniversary. We were in a brand new house, a brand new job in Millington, Tennessee. I said that with emphasis like that should impact you. <laughs> it shouldn't. But that's where I was. I was in Millington, Tennessee with my new bride in our new house, a brand new job. We were huddled around the television watching the New Year's festivities in Australia. And inside of a secret hidden closet, we had a whole four gallons of water. Four gallons of water that we had hidden away. Nobody knew where those four gallons of water were, by God, and they weren't going to find out. You may say, why were you watching TV on that day in Aus well, from Australia, and why were you hiding water? That seems a little odd. For those of you who are old enough, you may recognize that date as being the beginnings of Y2K, the day that the whole world was going to shut down because our computers were not going to be able to switch from 1999 to 2000. The day that had fooled every computer genius that had ever lived had slipped through and was about to take all the whole world back into the darkness of the caveman days. But I had water, four <laughs> gallons, and I was going to survive. Fortunately, as you know, Y2K came and went. And then I don't know where you were on December 21st, 2021, but I know where I was. 
For a month leading up to that day, I had been watching very scary news stories. I know that our news is never scary, and it's always encouraging and uplifting. But I was watching news, and people were going out, and they were charging up their credit cards to the limit because, after all, on December 22nd, we weren't going to be here no more. Why, you ask? Because the Mayan calendar was going to flip. And when it flips, hold on. It's about to go down. Well, as you can see, none of that happened. But through the ages and through the centuries, we have heard date setters and people say that, the, that this time and this date and this way that the world was going to end. And the real question to, for me to you this morning is, where were you when the world ended last time and where will you be when it ends again? I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there's something called the doomsday clock. Doomsday clock. Right? It was began in 1947 because of the threat of nuclear war. And I did a little research and I found that whenever they set up the doomsday clock, it was set for seven minutes till midnight. Because once it struck midnight, guess what happens? You got it right, end of the world. So I did some research. Do you know where it is now? A hundred seconds to midnight. A hundred seconds to midnight. Welcome to Grace, the church of encouragement. I'm glad you came here this morning. Well, what if you knew? You know, I came out of the Assemblies of God, and we, we constantly were setting, no, we never set dates, we knew better than that, but we had these huge charts. Anybody ever, ever had those in your church? These huge charts that were felt boards, and we had it all figured out until what we figured out didn't happen, and then guess what we did? New felt boards! <laughs> and we just moved the characters wherever we needed to be. But what if you knew? I have uh, preached uh, three years now, uh, the last sermon of the year, and the first year after I preached, uh, COVID happened. You're welcome for that, by the way. And after the second year, I brought you Delta. You're welcome for that. Hello, Omicron. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? I don't think Rick's going to book me again. But in all honesty, what if you knew that 2022 really was the last year? that something was going to happen, either we would pass away or Jesus would come back. How, what would you do and how would you at any moment? And, and, he, and when Jesus returns to earth, the entire earthly order will come to an end. The New Testament is full of scriptures with language like the Lord is at hand in Philippians and the Lord is coming near in James. Even in Revelations, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come soon. Which I think all of us would say, Yes, amen. Any day I am okay with. So how soon is soon? How soon is soon? I remember, I know you're going to think I'm exaggerating, but I remember, I distinctly remember the day that I was walking across my seminary, uh, Assemblies of God University in Waxahachie, Texas, and I was walking from the dorms in, inside of this field. And I remember the day that I prayed. I was getting close to being married. Uh, I only had a few months off, and I prayed, God, please, I am so close. Please do not come until I get married. Right? I just, I want, to know, I want to have a child, God. I want to have a child. I want to know. And I, I really, in all honesty, I don't know if I was praying for Jesus to wait for a child or the honeymoon night. I don't know which one it was. But all I know is I was praying for Jesus to wait. And now I pray, God, I have earned grandchildren. Many, many grandchildren. I have one and I'm addicted to grandchildren. So God... And all my daughters said, amen. All right. <laughs> How soon is soon? How soon is soon? If you've ever read The Voyage of the Day Treader by C.S. Lewis, you may remember this conversation between Lewis, uh, I'm sorry, Lu Lucy and Aslan. Aslan in the story is the lion, this Christ-like figure in the story. And he looks at Lu Lucy and he says, Do not be sad. We shall soon uh, meet again. And she said, please, Aslan, uh, what do you call soon? And to which he responded, I call all times soon. We serve a God who's infinite in time and days and numbers 
and is the God of the past, the present, and the future. I have a motto that says this, live like he's coming tomorrow, plan like he's not coming for a hundred years. And so let's do that. If soon is soon, and we truly believe that he could come back in 2022 or something could happen to us, what do we need to do? How would we live our life? And I think Peter gives us some clues on a good way to do it. Number one, and this is inside of your notes, he says, uh, this is inside your notes, keep your emotions under control so you can pray. Keep your emotions under control so that you can pray. In verse 7 it says, the end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. That word translated, uh, I'm sorry, that word sober minded is translated, uh, or we see it again in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus encounters a man that is full of demons, and they name him, uh, he names himself Legion. And in one word, in one word, Jesus delivers him. Isn't that amazing? In one word, a whole legion of demons are brought to their knees, and this man is delivered. And Scripture says that after that happens, the man is put inside of his right mind. That's the same thing. Sober mind, right mind. It gives us this inclination of, or this idea of being emotionally uh, under control, the state of emotional control so that under pressure we don't wilt, we don't waver, we don't give in to anxiety or worry, but we stay in our right mind. I suspect that if we knew that tomorrow was the end, that we would take time today We would slow down. Our priorities would change. And we would spend some good time with our family, with our friends, with our loved ones, right? We would take that time to be with one another. And Peter says, listen, not only that, but there's another really good reason, and probably the most important reason is slow down so you can pray. Slow down so you can pray. Another reason is that we should slow down and we should pray because whenever we're always on a tear... We're always uptight. We're always running around. We're always, we're never slowing down. It's easy to become distracted and be controlled totally by your circumstances. What happens is that you can't pray. Your mind is whizzing around you. You can't stop yourself long enough. You get controlled by your emotions or controlled by the circumstances. And you don't take time to sit in the presence of God and just pray and let him lift the worries off of your soul. When we can't slow down, we can't focus long enough to pray. It reminds me of a great song uh, that was inspired by the great composers Alabama. <laughs> in the song entitled, I'm in a hurry and don't know why. Precious song to the Lord. These lyrics are in there. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. Isn't that truth to that though, isn't it? There's great truth. The point is this. In the light of the approaching end, uh, slow down and pray. And the only advice that I can add to that is start at the beginning of your day before the pressures of life uh, encompass you. Number two is this. Oh, you're going to like this one. Be quick to forgive the stupid things other people do. Let me rephrase that for you. Be quick to forgive the stupid things other people do. Right? Because we're wonderful and perfect. Number, verse 8 says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sin. That word deeply better translated is fervently. Fervently to love one another. It gives this picture of a uh, runner running for the tape at the end, for that stripe at the end, to beat everyone else. And he's making long strides and pushing himself in order to get there. Or the outfielder that's jumping up to catch the fly ball, that that strain. And that's the picture that we get here is to fervently love and to bear with one another. It means to be stretched out and that love goes on and on. And we must make the effort because, listen to me, church, how many of you know true love is difficult? True love costs us something. True love, we have to become vulnerable and allow people into the innermost uh, sanctuary, if you will, of our hearts. It is a place where we are putting in our place where, you know what, you could be very hurt. But if we don't risk being hurt, we will never know what true love is. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, it's a little long, so bear with me, but I love what he says. Listen to this. He says, 
To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrong, and it will possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping your heart intact, you must give your heart to no one. Wrap it carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. He says, lock it up safe in a casket of your own selfishness. There, it will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. Isn't that powerful? There's a reason for this command. <clears throat> Sorry. There's a reason for this command that we are to love with a stretched out love. It's because Peter says to love covers a multitude of, sin, multitude of sins. You know, when every time someone wrongs me, I have two choices. I'm sorry, I put up one finger. I have two choices. Number one, I can deal with it, I can forgive it, I can cover it, and I can move on. I have that right. Or number two, I can drag that person through the mud and in hatred stir up all kinds of dissension. This love that Peter is talking about is that love refuses to wash its dirty laundry in public. Now, before I go on, let me put an asterisk to this. I'm not talking about in this abuse. I'm not talking about if you're being physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally abused. If you are in that, you don't have to be in that relationship, and we can help you escape that. But putting that aside... Love refuses to wash its dirty laundry in public. Love handles it privately and only brings it out in the public as a last resort. <clears throat> in my family, you can ask any of my daughters and my wife, in my family we have a saying because I know that in every family if you were to peel back, you know what I'm talking about, peel the onion back a little bit, there's always something inside of our families that we really don't want other people to see. Or to know. Because we live with imperfect people. Would you agree with that? We all have those things. But there's something that we do inside of my family. And I may have told you this before. But uh, any time that me uh, or one of my daughters or my wife says the words family business, they know exactly what it means. It's family business. Nobody else knows about what goes on. Nobody. Not my parents. Not her parents. No, no friends. Whenever something goes on in our house... That is good, bad, ugly, no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody does. If it falls up under the issue of family business, nobody else, falls out, nobody else knows about it. What do we do with it? Well, we do this. We, first there is love, and then there is forgiveness, and then there's the third thing. There is silence. That's what we do with it. We put it up under the blood because we realize that none of us are perfect. Love has a short memory and sealed lips. And we need to remember this because you know what? We need to hear this because the truth of the matter is, is that others will fail us multitude of times, right? We will fail other people multitude of times. Am I right? And so whenever we go through this, we have to remember that love goes on loving anyway. And this applies to every part of our life. So how do we cover these sins? How do we cover sins when people do not admit their mistake? How do we cover sins when there is no confession or there is no repentance? What do we do with those things? You see, R.T. Kendall, in his book, Total Forgiveness, he makes a helpful point. And he says this, If you wait for others to repent, most of the time you will wait forever. He says this, he says, Very often people will hurt you, and people who hurt you either don't know about it, don't see it, or pretend that it never happened. And we must, be, we must go on forgiving anyway. There are six things that he gives us to show that we have covered up the sin. And these are the, thing, the, the six signs of true or total forgiveness. And these are them. Number one, you do not tell anybody what they did to you. You don't tell anybody what they did to you. Now, this is hard for Christians sometimes, right? Because you ever had anyone put in a prayer request? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Don't tell anyone else, but I need you to pray. Then they level somebody to the ground. And you're like, how about we pray you stop gossiping first, and then we can pray. I know. Oh, praise the Lord. Number two, you do not, you do not, ah, hmm, Jesus. You do not try to intimidate them. Number three. You do not let them feel guilty. Number four, 
You let them save face. Number five, you accept the matter of total forgiveness as a life sentence. You have to keep doing it indefinitely. Number six, you pray that they will be blessed and let off the hook. That's a big part of the Christian job description. Forgiving people and letting them off the hook. When nobody else seemingly knows why. Because the truth is, is that whenever we remember where Christ found us and what he has cleaned us from, we have to remember what right do we have to hold against anybody anything. And I know, I know, there's, there's plenty of excuses out there. There's a lot of people that say, well, you don't understand this, you don't know this, you don't know what happened, you don't know. Listen, I never said it was easy, but our, this is the problem with our excuses, is that none of our excuses for not forgiving people, none of those excuses are biblical. We just say them because we're hurt. We just say them because we want to hold something against them and hope that something that we may get some retribution. But in truth, that's not what Christ does. That's not what Christ did for us, and he doesn't want us to do it for others. Amen? Number three is this. Stop complaining. <laughs> I like that one. Stop complaining and start uh, sharing what God has given you. Uh, the scriptures offer hospitality one another without grumbling. The word hospitality means kindness shown to family and friends, but also to strangers. You see, back in that time when this was written, it was vitally important that people opened up their homes and allowed other people to come into their homes because they didn't have sanctuaries, they didn't have auditoriums, they didn't have anywhere else to go. And so the early church relied on these people, to, uh, the early Christians, to open their homes, to offer hospitality, to give them a meal to eat, to give them clothing if they need it, to fill their bellies and to make sure that they weren't cold. You see, they had traveling evangelists and they had traveling pastors that would go from time to time. And if no one opened their homes, they didn't have anywhere else to go. It's important that we understand that Jesus gave us our homes, not as a status symbol, but number one, to give us shelter for our family, but number two, as a tool of ministry, to be able to offer people a place to come whenever they need it. Are you hungry? Here, come have a meal with me. Are you thirsty? Come, have a drink. You see, it's very difficult to tell people about Jesus when they're hungry or when they're cold. First, you take care of their physical needs, and then they open up with their spiritual needs. You see, these are the type of things that Jesus has given us. Just like in our small groups, we, we open up our homes so that we can share life together. And the truth is, is listen, I mean this with all genuous, genuineness. I don't know how people make it during hard times that don't have a church. I don't understand how people can go through that. I don't know what I would do if I don't have people coming up to me and just going, you know what, I'm praying for you. What can I do for you? Is there anything that you need? Come to my house. We'll go for a meal. Come, come and talk for just a moment. Let's, let me help you relieve your burdens off of you for just a moment. You see, I believe that church, that it, it, it takes each one of us to do that. And, and I believe small groups are important. But beyond that, I believe that all of us must do that. And if we ever lose that aspect of our church we're not a church anymore we're just a gathering of people we must welcome one another uh, everyone that comes through with a hospitality and a love for each other number four is this use your god-given gifts to bless others use your god-given gifts to bless others each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards um of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one speaks the very words of God. <laughs> that's harder, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Especially when someone cuts you off in traffic, right? And you're saying things that may not be the very words, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You know. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power of forever and ever. Amen. He says each one should give, should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. This little phrase tells us three things about gifts. Number one, every believer has a spiritual gift. Number two, your gift may not be the same as, anybody, as, as anyone else's. And number three, you are to use your gift to serve other people. 
Our God made a, us a manifold body of Christ that is like many folds in a blanket or many colors of the same fold of, uh, co- a blanket. Together we make up one body. We make up one blanket, if you will. And if we're missing one gift, if we're missing one of your talents, one of your gifts because it's not in service, understand we are not complete unless all of us are doing something within the body of Christ to serve other people both inside these walls and outside these walls. And no gift is too small. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, I'm just a greeter. I don't do... No, greeters are some of the most important people in the church. I cannot tell you how many times we read cards from visitors whenever we get them in and they say, you know what? What I, what I remember most about was how I was greeted whenever I walked into your church with a warm smile, a handshake, someone knowing my name many times, and I was welcomed in. You see, that's what church is all about. That's what we as Christians are all about. We welcome people in. No matter their walk of life, no matter what they've gone through, each of us has a gift to reach out to others, to use inside of the body of Christ. And we must be about doing it. If you shine a light through a prism, you're going to get all, all the colors of the rainbow. It should be the same for us whenever Christ's light shines through this body of Christ. Peter says this at the end. He says, the end of all things is near. You know, I was thinking about that as I was wrapping up uh, the sermon. Have you ever been in service when Kenny is singing a, a song and a pause comes in and everybody starts clapping and then he starts another verse? Anyone else ever seen that? You know what I'm talking about? Everybody starts clapping, then he starts singing and you're like, oh yeah, praise the Lord. And you're like, man, I'm glad I didn't fall for that one. You know what I'm talking about. This white guy just danced on stage. That's never happened. I've been to plays like that before. I've been to plays where they, they did like a short pause in the play and everybody got up and started clapping and then they started... <laughs> I think that is so funny when they do that. You ever done that and just sit back and watched everybody else because you know the song had another chorus? You're like... <laughs> oh, no, I know you didn't. Praise God. I don't either. Um, but the truth is, is that I think it was Shakespeare or somebody, somebody great. I can't remember who it was truthfully, but they said this. They said, but the truth is that the play is not over until the author steps on the stage. Isn't that true? The play is not over until the author steps on the stage. So as we live our life and go through 2022, whether it is the end of days or the end of times or not, we have to remember one thing. The play is not over until the author steps on the stage. And so until that moment happens, when the author does step on the stage, let us be about the master's business. May we be found keeping our emotions under control so that we can pray. May we be found being quick to forgive the stupid things other people do and the stupid things that we do ourselves. May we be found not complaining And may we be found sharing what God has given us. And may we be found using our God-given gifts to bless others. Because that really is truly what it's all about, blessing other people. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. You have given us another day to glorify your name. You have given us another day to serve somebody else. To wash the feet of of somebody that's in need. So I pray this week, God, I pray that as we get ready to leave and life begins, that you help us, encourage us, remind us to slow down and serve the person next to us, to love the person next to us with the love that comes only from heaven. And Lord, that as we serve and wash feet and take care of one another, may your name be glorified, not ours. May you be lifted up, not us. And may you get all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.